Well, the Biden administration is not only proposing new taxes, they're proposing new taxes on old money. We'll talk about that, plus our one-on-one -on -one with Toby Mathis today on The Bizpo Show. Welcome to the BizPo Show from Dallas, Texas. I'm Seth Denson, joined as always by my good buddy up north, Dan Geltrude. Dan, how are you, my friend? I'm good, Seth. How are you? Man, I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm scared for our economy. I'm scared for investors, but I'm scared for small businesses. And I'm sure we're going to unpack that because the Biden administration is really holding strong to not only raising the capital gains tax, but retro raising it all the way back to April of this year, which means Man, a lot of people that didn't plan for it could be getting a hefty tax bill. So what does America's accountant have to say about this? When we talk about tax fairness, or I should say, when a lot of other people talk about tax fairness, they're always talking about how people are not paying enough. And we could certainly argue that point back and forth about what is a fair amount for people to pay. What I don't think we can question here is a retroactive tax and whether that's fair. The answer it is is completely unfair. I don't it doesn't matter how much money you make or any of that Seth. How about this? You do a stock transaction. You sell a stock. You sell that stock based upon what you know is the tax rate. The transaction closes, it's over and done with, and then you find out after the fact that the capital gains tax on that was much higher, significantly higher than what you planned it to be. So much so, it would have influenced your decision to do the transaction in the first place. Now, I say that's completely unfair. Well, and I'll take it a step further, Dan, because again, I think we oftentimes when we hear capital gains, we immediately think Wall Street. We think hedge funds, we think private equity, we think investors. We don't often think about small businesses. And here's the reality. If I have a small business and I have invested my life in building that business, oftentimes to the detriment of building a retirement account, I'm doing so recognizing that one day I'm gonna sell that business. And when I do, that becomes my retirement account. On average, in the United States, we have about 10,000 small business transactions, that's transactional sales, per year. I've got to be thinking about that small business owner right now who maybe just sold their business and in their building out that kind of their financial plan was planning on a cap gains tax, not necessarily where it's going to be, but where it is, and now they're going to be left holding the bag. What, is, what say you on that? I say that makes it even more personal and more unfair because you're right. When we talk about uh, people who are trading stocks, sometimes the tendency is to think, well, those are the fat cats. Those are all those, those rich guys. But as you just laid it out in, in really an outstanding way, what about the person who spent a lifetime investing back into their family business and when they get to the end retirement age and they want to sell it for their you know that's the exit strategy and all of a sudden after the fact they've changed the rules of the game well listen we don't have to go all that far back to see where this has happened before california 2012 the state of California decided to roll out a new income tax structure and retro it back. They did this in November. It was retro back to January. Fast forward to today, California has more debt than any other state, double the debt of places like New York. Uh, I don't know that I love the idea that the federal government is now taking its tax cues from the state of California. Nonetheless, this is going to be an ongoing topic. I got to think, since we've got America's accountant, we're going to be talking about it a lot. Hopefully, we'll be talking about this not happening. But nonetheless, 
our guest this week, man, he's fantastic. Uh, if you are an investor or you're considering being inve an investor in something, you're going to want to really hear what Toby Mathis has to say, and he'll join us right after the break. Welcome back to the Biz Post Show. Our guest this week is Toby Mathis. He's a tax attorney and one of the founding partners of Anderson Business Advisors. He's also the author of a great book, I encourage you to pick it up, called Infinity Investing, How the Rich Get Richer and How You Can Do the Same. I will tell you, I picked up this book myself and immediately called some of the people that I look to for financial advice and said, have you read this book? So Toby, welcome to the Biz Post Show. Hey, thanks for having Absolutely. me. Absolutely. So your book, Infinity, Infinity Investing, I have to say, I, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, for our viewers, though, could you maybe explain the premise of Infinity Investing? Yeah, absolutely. First off, just know that the, the, the reason that I even have the premise is because I'm a tax attorney with a practice here. We do about 10,000 returns for investors every year. And so I stole every idea that I could from the people that are actually successful at doing it. I'm, I'm not an original thinker, so don't don't think it's anything special, and I'm certainly not a guru. Uh, but the premise is really simple, that if you don't want to work, you need to replace your income with something that's generated, whether you're sleeping, going to Fiji, surfing, whatever you're doing, you know, is that it's being generated without you, which requires the purchase of actual assets that generate income. And then you're just replacing what you live off of with that income. Once you've replaced it, then you could live an infinite number of days without having to worry about working. And if you want to work, fantastic. You can volunteer. You know, you, you can still go get a paycheck, but you're not required to. So you're not living paycheck to paycheck anymore. You actually have enough money coming in to where, again, an infinite number of days you could live without having to break into your savings or, or sell things off, which is really what I see as the biggest mistake most people make is they go in there and they try to do a quick hit they try to make money on a stock and then they're done like that that's the money they've made then they try to duplicate it and it's really tough to to duplicate and they end up chasing their tail and one negative life event like the pandemic taught us uh you could have lose a job or you could have an unexpected illness or something and it really screws you up and causes you a lot of financial pain and in some cases financial ruin so we're just trying to very methodically attack that and make sure that we don't put ourselves in that position. So you discuss in the book, book things like dividends and assets that pay for liabilities, everything you just kind of mentioned, right? This infinite uh, mm -hmm. lifestyle that, that there's income replacement. Um, in looking at the market though, there's really only about 30 stocks or so that have consistently paid out a dividend. and. Typically, those stocks can be pretty expensive. So what do you say to someone who's really just kind of starting out and saying, yeah, I, you know, I'm looking at Ford or maybe Coca-Cola or some of these other stocks that are out there that pay a nice dividend. I can't afford very many shares, and that dividend surely isn't going to be a lot uh, paid out unless I buy more shares. So where would you tell people to start when they're building their portfolio? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question, and it, it's something that, that I address extensively both in what we teach and in, in, in what's in writing, which is to create a systematic approach. Like you're going to be doing something repeatedly over time. So don't expect a, a quick, you know, get rich quick. It's going to be building the correct type of portfolio and knowing that every time I put a brick in place, I'm not going to be removing it anytime soon. It might be there for 200 years. So if I do buy a Coca-Cola, which has been paying increasing dividends, for more than 50 years. In other words, every year, more money gets paid out to their shareholders than the previous year. If you have one share, every year, if it's 10 cents one year, it's 11 cents the next, it's 12 cents the next, it's been increasing for 50 plus years. All you're doing is putting that in place so that if you do this consistently over a long enough time horizon, you're guaranteed to have financial independence at some point. So even though when you're beginning, you say, oh, you know, Coca-Cola is right around 55, 60 bucks all the time, Oh, that's really expensive. Well, you start there and you pick up shares. And I'm not saying go out and buy Coca-Cola. I'm saying you were going to buy something that's similar that's been paying an increasing dividend for at least 25 years. And so you're, you're dead on. There's probably only about 60, 30, 60, depending on what time horizon you use, that even fit the, the mold. And then out of that 30, there might be only two that are really a good buy right now. It makes the market get really small really quick. And you're buying it for the income that it's producing, not hoping that the stock goes up. 
not praying, you know, hold and pray. Oh, I hope it goes up someday so I could sell it and make money. No, you're buying it to generate income. And I don't even want you to look at the value of that stock in the future. I want you to look at what it's generating. Toby, you're a tax attorney and I'm America's accountant. So I wanted to just bring up a couple tax related issues. Now, Joe Biden is proposing some, well, pretty heavy duty increases in capital gains. And what I personally find most disturbing is he wants to make that retroactive going back to April of 2021. So what's your take on how that's got if, if that does happen? What kind of impact do you think that's going to have on the market? Really interesting point there about having a retroactive tax. There's people that say it's been decided and there's there's actually cases. I believe the case that they usually rely on actually said you can't make retroactive criminal laws and therefore the civil stuff is still open. I don't think it's ever really been tried at the Supreme Court level as to whether that's constitutional or not, regardless of whether they apply it. So let, let's say that they do. And there has been situations where they have applied a retroactive tax, but it, I don't believe that they were contested and I don't believe that we had final resolution. But let's just say that they can do it. What is it going to do? It's only going to affect people that are making capital, have incomes over a million dollars first off. And those people can afford accountants who are going to show them what easy ways to avoid the tax anyway. So I don't think it's going to have that big of a play. The one that interests me more is the increase of the corporate tax. And it's a fundamental misunderstanding by most polit politicians as what that impact really is. You go ahead and you increase corporate taxes. First off, you should say, how much of an impact is that really going to have on our position as a country? Like, they always kind of play funny math, but at the end of the day, corporations pay about 7.8% of the total taxes in this country. It's not a huge amount, right? So if I if I was if I was going to double that and I was going to say let's really hammer the corporations, that's still a pretty small amount when you talk about these massive uh, spending increases. It's really not going to get us there and it's going to have the opposite effect. When you increase the taxes on a corporation, a lot of people say corporations don't actually pay tax. They pass it on to their consumers or they pass it on to the shareholders. They really, it's, it, it's the consumer that ends up paying it. And nowhere is that more evident than when you talk about utilities, where the tax expense is something that they pass on directly to the, to, to the consumer, which happens to be everybody, right? Everybody's using the electrical grid. Everybody's using utilities. So it's not fair to say we're raising taxes on corporations. What they're really saying is we're raising taxes on you. Well, you're, you're also talking about some people in Congress having common sense. That, that is becoming uh, more rare, unfortunately, than we'd like. Uh, now, let me, let me just shift over to uh, you know, what's been going on in the stock market there's been some, a lot of ups and downs related to stocks like AMC and GameStop. So what, what's your advice to investors who see that shiny object out there when they're hearing about these stocks like AMC rising 3,000%? What, what do you tell them about that? Uh, I tell them the same thing that I say to people that come and visit my city. I live in Las Vegas. And I say that blackjack is a lot of fun to play, but you could lose all your money doing it. And if you play it long enough, the stats are not in your favor. You're going to lose all your money. In other words, there's, there's these billion-dollar buildings down there that were built because people leave their money behind, not because they're taking all the, the, the casino's money with them. So it's not an investment. It's gambling is what it is. And it can be fun, and you could have fun with it. Like, hey, I'm going to be part of the social revolution, and I'm going to stick it to the hedge funds that are trying to short these companies. Or I'm going to show that you know, because uh, because Reddit or any social media platforms that we decide we're going to all buy something and create an artificial demand for it that it's going to jack up, that somehow that's a that's a long term play. It's not. I think uh, I think one of you gentlemen once said it's musical chairs, right? And so and, and eventually the music stops and somebody's going to be left out and somebody's not going to have a seat to sit in, and that's the person that's going to lose a fortune because they decided to to, to gamble. 
uh, that's how I look at AMC and GM, GME. You know, you look at all these different companies that that they're pushing on any given moment, BlackBerry, you name it. Um, and it's fun, and it's really interesting from a social standpoint. Like when you see somebody's about to short your favorite company, you get together with a few million of your friends and you buy it and make it and jack it up to to kind of hose the the shorters. I I like that. I think that's hilarious. Um, they may not like it, but that's the game that you're playing, right? Uh, but that's not an investment. An investment feeds you. An investment pays you to own it. And uh, one of the rules that I use is assets feed you, liabilities bleed you. So if something's putting money in your pocket, it's an asset. And so whenever somebody says, well, what do you think of AMC? Is it putting money in my pocket? Well, if you sell it, that doesn't count. If by owning it, is it producing income to me? Is it putting money in my pocket? If the answer is no, then it's not an asset. If it's taking money out of my pocket, then it's a liability. So AMC doesn't really fit either category, right? So it's what I would call a cash or cash equivalent, and that's your play money. That's your gambling money. That's if you want to buy cryptos. That's if you want to buy gold and silver and invest in other currencies or whatever. Toby, in your book, you actually take to task the traditional broker market uh, and, and kind of how that operates, and you talk about instead – working with someone that's a fiduciary and or, you know, even opening your own account on, on a platform like Robinhood and, and managing uh, your own stocks and, and get away from high commission trades and things that are that are happening regularly in the brokerage market. What, what do you say to someone who's, again, kind of starting out? Do you say, hey, go seek out that fiduciary, mm -hmm. open up the Robinhood account, do both? What, what, do you, what is the advice you would give to someone who says, I'm ready to get started, what do I do? Yeah, so what I would tell somebody, it depends on what their net worth is and how, how much asset they have to play. If they're less than 50000 then I say you need to learn what these terms are, and it needs to be real to you. And the only way that's going to happen is if you actually do it. There's something called Beider-Meinhof uh, phenomenon or Beider-Meinhof syndrome, frequency illusion. You know, like, There's all different names for it. And the easiest way to understand what it is is if you've ever gone looking for a new car, like, hey, I'm going to go – look for a Toyota Tacoma, right? And I don't really notice too many Toyota Tacomas around until I decide I'm gonna look for a Toyota Tacoma. And then everywhere I look, there's a Toyota Tacoma. And I say, where did all these people get this Toyota Tacoma? Well, your mind's blocking it because it's not relevant to you. And so it's not letting you see it. There's a bunch of word games you can play to, to, to illustrate this point. But there's things that just aren't relevant to you, so they don't matter. So for example, if I buy AMC, all of a sudden, I hear AMC everywhere. Every news article seems to mention AMC, right? I'm just attuned to it now, and now I'm paying attention. So our minds work that way. And so if you're going to get involved in investing, make sure that you're learning, to use another bad analogy, like a good golf swing. You, you've got to start swinging correctly. Even if you're just doing small little swings, right, in the very beginning and you're learning how to do it, don't learn how to do it wrong. Learn how to do it correctly. So start buying assets, paying attention to the payout of those companies. And actually, once you do it and you start acquiring them for yourself, even if it's on a Robinhood app, even if it's one share, it becomes relevant to you. And now bid ask is relevant. Now your dividend yield is relevant. You're looking at the cash free flow. That's relevant. All these terms that normally you probably don't even think about become relevant to you because you're doing it. Now, where the fiduciary comes into play is when you have somebody else giving you advice, the question is whether they are required to act in your best interest. And the best example I can give you is if I went into a, a, a butcher shop and said to the butcher, what should I have to eat every single day? I'd like you to make me a menu. You know what the butcher is going to put on your menu, right? It's all going to be meat. You're going to be eating chicken, pork, beef every single day, right? And it may not be in your best interest. In other words, it may clog up some arteries. But if I go to a doctor or a nutritionist and I say, what should I be eating every day? The nutritionist is going to say, well, here's, you need to have some leafy greens. You need to eat a little bit, you know, avoid some, you know, let's, let's avoid all the red meat. You know, they're going to be a little bit different in the advice they give because they're looking at your overall well-being. So the butcher sells what they have to sell, and they don't have to worry about your best interest. So a broker doesn't have to worry about your best interest. A fiduciary, somebody who's a CFP or has a fiduciary license or is in a state that requires a fiduciary 
level of care, for example, 401ks have a fiduciary level of care, it's retirement plans, re fiduciary level of care, they have to look at what's in your best interest. So you've got to be really careful about who you're getting advice from. And so when I look at fiduciaries, they're not getting paid commissions in the traditional sense. They're quite often just getting paid some set fee, maybe, you know, we're going to use something called basis points, maybe maybe 70 basis points, which is really 0.7%, less than 1%, maybe 1%, depending on the size of your account. And they're just getting paid basically an override, as opposed to somebody else might be getting, uh, I, I've done the analysis on this, and we've torn apart a bunch of accounts. There's situations where the management fees, to somebody who's just putting you in a mutual fund, they're making 4% on your money. The average, actually, of a mutual fund is 4.8 to 5.8, but I've seen them at 11%, 13%, 7%, 8%, because they're not, they're not even required to disclose it all to you. It's basically buried in there and hidden, and you think that person is looking out for your best interest. And what they're really doing is making the most commission they can or the most revenue they can. Now, I always get hate mail when I say that, but it's true. And the truth is these people know it that they have a suitability standard versus a fiduciary standard, and they know dang well that they're selling products that they're getting paid a commission on or they're getting paid on more than what would be in that person's best interest. And they're just justifying it in their mind because they're working for a brokerage firm that says, hey, I'm going to pay you a really good chunk of money if you sell our mutual fund or if you sell our financial products. The book is Infinity Investing. The man is Toby Mathis. Toby, thanks for joining us today on the BizPo Show. Thanks, gentlemen. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the BizPo Show. If you're a regular viewer, you know that Seth and I like to share our final thoughts with you each week. So here's mine. Last week, on June 2nd, Major League Baseball, well, they had Lou Gehrig's day across every single game being played. And what did that do? That was about awareness related to that terrible disease, ALS, bringing awareness and also fundraising because it's so important to be able to do medical research. The point I want to make here was, well, a little bit bittersweet. A dear friend of mine, Jerry Tolby, who had been recently diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS. Well, he had the honor of singing the national anthem on Lou Gehrig Day at Yankee Stadium. And boy, that was really something to see. Now, I just want to say that Jerry Tolby, this man has just an incredible voice. And what a gift it is. And anybody who's ever heard him sing, well, it's not something they'll soon forget. And I can tell you this, anyone who heard Jerry sing the national anthem at Yankee Stadium, they will never forget that moment. And that's my final thought. Well, Dan, for my final thought, I'm actually want to talk about FOMO. I know what all the kids are saying, fear of missing out. This not is a is a symptom that not only uh, plagues our investments, but it also plagues our careers, our families, and oftentimes even our own personal happiness. Fear of missing out is what's driving things like GameStop and uh, AMC and the crypto craze. It's this idea that I can get ahead by following the crowd, and so. My final thought this week is to really challenge that and maybe give you some words that my father told me as I began my career. Here's what you don't do. Don't cut corners. Don't look for the easy way. Don't chase money. You'll often find you'll never catch it. Here's what you do. You get up early. You think long term. You work hard and you commit. Those that are willing to do what others don't often get to live the life that others won't. And that's my final thought. Well, that's tremendous, Seth. And I hope everyone will learn from your dad in that case. 
Well, that does it for this week's show. We hope you'll continue to tune in each week, and we hope you'll tell your friends all about us. From New York City, I'm Dan Geltrude. And from Dallas, Texas, I'm Seth Denson. Good night. Thank you.